Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Western Governors Association webinar, Conservation Districts and Invasive Species Management. This is the second webinar in a series for the WGA Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. Uh, we run today from 1 p.m. Mountain Time to 2.30 Mountain Time. Um, and before we kick off, I am going to turn it over to Kevin Moss from WGA. We'll go over some uh, logistics and um, technical details on how we're going to proceed today. Great. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. This is Kevin Moss, and thank you for joining. We're going to have uh, presentations from all of our panelists um, for the first half of the webinar. And then for the second half, we're going to have moderated discussion and Q&A. And so at any point during the webinar, you can send in questions to me, and you can do that using the chat box fe feature. So if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, there should be a cloud um, icon that you can click. And then once you click that, you can um, select to send messages privately to me, Kevin Moss, and then I will uh, forward them over to Travis, our, our moderator, to uh, incorporate into the discussion. And if you have any questions about how to do that, um, you can either send me an email or use the chat box function. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, just a little background today on uh, this, uh, the webinar series and the initiative more generally. So this is the second um, in the series for the Go Western Governors Association Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. The initiative is, this is the signature initiative of, Gov of WGA Chair, Hawaii Governor David Ige. We launched this uh, whole series in July of this last year with a webinar um, and with uh, and then followed by a series of four workshops throughout the West. And the goal uh, with what we've been doing here is to try to bring together state, federal, tribal, nonprofit, um, industry leaders, a wide variety of stakeholders to discuss issues of biosecurity and invasive species management at the, in the West. Look at looking at both biosecurity, the work that's being done to keep new new species out, um, to protect the West, uh, Western agriculture, Western industry, uh, and human health from new pathogens and pests, and then uh, the work on invasive species as to what land managers and uh, stakeholders are doing to control and um, manage invasive of species once they're established. And uh, we've accomplished that through a series of four workshops. Uh, the first one kicked off in Lake Tahoe, Nevada in September, focusing on prevention, control, and management of established species. That was followed by a, fo a workshop focusing on restoration in Cheyenne, Wyoming in October. Um, then a workshop on Helena, Montana on early detection and rapid response. And finally, a workshop on the Kohala Ho coast of Hawaii focusing on biosecurity and agriculture. For those of you who um, have been following the WGA initiative up to this point and have been active, we uh, appreciate all the effort you've put into this. Um, but for those of you who are new to what we're doing, all of those workshops that I mentioned are recorded on our website. So if you're curious about the other conversations that we've had, uh, we recommend uh, you can find live streams from all of our workshops there. So at westgov.org, uh, recommend that you take a look at those on our initiatives page. So those workshops end in December, and they're followed by where we are now, which is a series of webinars targeting uh, specific topics arising from the initiative. Our, our initial one was on the impacts of invasive species on fisheries. Uh, that was in February. And then this one is uh, focusing on the work that conservation districts do on invasive species management. I think this is uh, a great topic. Conservation districts are all some of the most um, important people in the fight against invasive species, some of the most dedicated and impassioned people working on this issue. Uh, they're really the boots on the ground. and without the work of conservation districts, uh, we would really uh, not, very little would happen on invasive species management. So I'm really glad that we're able to talk about this, and I'm really glad that you're able to join us for that conversation. I think we've got a great group of panelists. Uh, everything that we're discussing, both of the workshops and through this webinar, um, help um, inform uh, the Western Governors Association as they make their policy on invasive species and biosecurity and help inform um, a report that we'll be rolling out in June of this year. So we uh, encourage you to stay tuned for that um, and when the initiative uh, concludes at our uh, annual meeting in Vail, Colorado in June. And so for today's conversation, um, we have a really impressive group of experts on invasive species management and who um, and how it is uh, conducted through conservation districts. And I'm really thrilled about our moderator today. We've got Travis Thomason from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, Travis is a native of Idaho, he, where he grew up surrounded by agriculture on his small family farm. And then uh, 
he is alumni of Brigham Young, Young University and uh, has since then has uh, committed himself to a life of working to improve conservation and agriculture through his work in the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service where he's worked for um, in Utah, Pennsylvania, and Idaho. And in addition to that, he's also just been a world traveler having lived and worked in both Japan and Mexico. And we're really happy to have him as part of this uh, lead us the conversation today. He's just uh, just getting to know him. He's just really got a lot of passion and expertise on this issue, and I think he really sort of believes in the the role that conservation conservation districts can play in conservation and invasive species management. And I can't think of a better person to have on today. So, um, with that, Travis, I'll hand it off to you. So we appreciate you having it here, and it's uh, the webinar is yours for now. All right, thank you, Bill. Really appreciate that introduction and uh, look forward to the opportunity to moderate today's uh, engaging and energizing discussion on invasive species management, uh, but it would not be a proper Hawaii uh, welcome uh, without um, saying aloha and uh, welcome to everybody on the discussion. I really look forward to uh, talking about some really powerful opportunities uh, and uh, looking at some solutions as far as invasive species management goes across the West and in the Pacific Island area. I'd like to thank, uh, of course, uh, Kevin and Bill and the entire WGA staff uh, for coordinating these great webinars. Uh, really appreciate Hawaii Governor Ige's initiative in his capacity as WGA chairman to champion the effort in bringing biosecurity and invasive species management to the forefront of our collective conservation efforts. And of course, we have some great panelists on today. Uh, thank you to May, Michelle, Lindsay, and Debbie uh, for sharing their experiences with the group today. I just wanna share a, a couple of quick things uh, about uh, NRCS invasive species management. As you're all aware, everyday invasive species threaten the health of our nation's vital uh, ag and natural lands. Forests and rangelands are becoming infested. Crop production is adversely impacted. Streams and waterways are being choked with invasive species. And of course, wildlife habitat is on the decline. These conditions are just a few of the negative impacts that will continue and will become more severe if successful actions, collaborative efforts are not taken to halt or reverse these trends that stem from invasive species. Um, again, as Bill mentioned earlier, my name is Travis Thomason. I'm the Director of State Conservationist, as many of you may know, uh, for USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service in the Great Pacific Islands area. It sends all the way from Hawaii, uh, Micronesia, Guam, uh, Northern Marianas, down to the American Samoan Islands. Ours is a federal agency tasked with delivering conservation solutions to America's farmers, ranchers, and private forest landowners. Management of invasives is critical to the success of our mission. Many of our technical and financial assistance programs target the management of invasive species and pests. Many of you know uh, our programs, uh, such as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and uh, RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, that provide um, producers and many of our partners um, incentives to manage invasive species. Uh, some of you may also know the Conservation Innovation Grant um, that program funds innovative conservation approaches and technologies to accelerate technology transfer and adoption of promising technologies and approaches to addressing some of our nation's most pressing natural resource concerns, especially and importantly, uh, invasive species. Just some quick numbers, um, and selfishly about NRCS, since the 2008 Farm Bill, we've invested in thousands of conservation projects uh, at the local level to help pre producers tree over 20 million acres uh, that address invasive species management. Specifically, if you're interested in knowing more about the EQIP program, it is one of our largest programs. Uh, we've entered into almost 19,000 contracts covering uh, almost 13 million acres in the amount of uh, almost $400 million in investments in, in projects 
uh, since the 2008 Farm Bill. So we're really excited. Uh, our programs are great, but they're even better, even arguably the best when they're guided by local input which is why I'm really excited uh, to moderate the discussion with the ever important conservation districts. If you aren't familiar with conservation districts, um, I encourage you um, to understand more about the critical role they play in local conservation efforts by uh, contacting your local conservation district and finding more, out, finding more about them. In my career with NRCS, I've seen conservation districts do great and awesome things. Um, in fact, I, I have a quick experience I wanted to share with the group that, that highlights the importance of conservation districts at the local level. I've been with NRCS uh, for about 15 years. Uh, when I was uh, a young district conservationist in the state of Utah, um, I worked with uh, the local conservation district board um, to address uh, some water quality and invasive species issues in a particular watershed in Wasatch County. At that time, uh, the Conservation District Board uh, asked me if I would uh, go to the local county council and uh, solicit their support to attend a uh, watershed uh, scoping meeting that was coming up. I uh, passionately agreed because I was excited about the effort to uh, continue uh, those efforts there in the county. and. The Conservation District gave me a letter on their letterhead to uh, give to the, the county uh, commissioners, council members, and uh, solicit their participation. Um, this county at the time was going through significant growth, and uh, this particular council meeting that I attended uh, had uh, a few developers at the meeting, and it was a passionate discussion as these developers worked with the council to try and get their development um, passed uh, to continue on uh, for success of their projects. Uh, unfortunately for the developers, um, those projects were not approved by the county council and um, it was a really heated discussion. And as I was next on the agenda, I got a little bit nervous and wanted to leave for fear of them not accepting uh, this awesome proposal. Um, as the developers discussion ended, I was on the agenda next. Um, I stood up and went around and handed this letter with the conservation district letterhead to each of the county commissioners. One of the commissioners, uh, Mike was still hot. And I heard him as I waited for my turn say to one of his, his uh, council member friends there, uh, who is this guy and what does he want? And uh, again, my heart sunk uh, for, for fear of rejection, I suppose. Um, fortunately though, his uh, adjacent council member looked at the letter I just gave him, looked at the letterhead and immediately said, oh, He's with the conservation district. It must be important. I then went on uh, to talk about the importance of this watershed plan and uh, all the council members attended and that watershed plan was uh, successfully implemented over a few years period. And I learned that day um, and over that experience that if I wanted to be successful with any conservation program, whether it be federal, state or local, it needed to be hand in hand with the conservation districts. So I'm excited to hear from the conservation districts today. I'm gonna to stop there and turn it over to our panelists uh, who will then share their experiences uh, with managing invasive species and the efforts, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, again, after we hear from our panelists, we'll jump into a moderated discussion as a group. Uh, again, I'll remind anyone who would like to submit a question for any of the panelists to send the question to Kevin uh, through the chat feature. Uh, thank you again for your participation today. May, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Travis, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is May Nakahata from the Central Maui Soil and, Soil and Water Conservation District in Hawaii. Today, I would like to share with you some unintended impacts of invasive species and how they have affected our districts in Hawaii. Conservation planning is a major role of the districts. 
along with recommending practices such as cover crops for soil health, beneficial insects, and erosion control. We never thought of cover crops to be a haven to carriers of serious health concerns such as meningitis. Food safety awareness has highlighted risks associated with feral animals and E. coli, salmonella, and other foodborne illnesses, but this was new to us. Early in the 2000s, this little um, creature appeared in the island. It's called a semi-slug. It looks like a slug with a backpack, a remnant of a mantle on its back. They are quite small, the adult being about five centimeters in length. Visitors and residents have succumbed to what is now known as the rat lung worm disease. Many people are not aware of the risks and will pick up a fruit from an orchard or a leaf from a kale plant and begin consuming them without wash. In one case on the Big Island, six people got sick at once by ingesting a beverage that was left out in the patio overnight. They did not know until it was too late that the slugs had crawled into the pitcher. The life cycle of the rat lung worm involves a rat, an amphibian, and finally the mammal, whether it be humans or pets. The organism begins in the rat and the larvae is passed by its feces to the amphibian. Slugs, snails, frogs, crustaceans are all known carriers of the rat lung worm. Mammals can ingest the slugs or remnants of them, resulting in health consequences. Children playing in the yard are especially susceptible as toddlers tend to put things into their mouths without much thought. Water left for pets in the patio are also a source as the slugs can go into the water and the, um, your pet dog ingesting them as they drink the water. Well, Hawaii has been highlighted in many cases as the location of the rat lung worm. Incidences have occurred across the country, ranging from California to New York. Conservation districts became involved as one of our conservation planning practices involves cover crops that are known to be slug havens. While it may lure the slug away from the beneficial from your commercial crop, it also provides a habitat from which slugs may enter the field. Water hoses left on the ground is a favorite habitat. Due to the serious health, concern, health con consequences, the mere presence of a slug or snail trail on a leaf of lettuce is cause for removal from store shelves. Our farmers have suffered severe losses of cilantro, kale, lettuces, um, and other um, leafy vegetables just because of the fear of these um, organisms on, on their crops. Even as we have had no commercial farmer associated with any of the illnesses. The standard is no tolerance and vendors will require evidence of slug, snail, frog management in the fields. This means treating field areas adjacent to the crop. Cover crop boundaries need to be treated for slugs, snails, or frogs to have it in an amphibian-free zone. Conservation planners can share management practices when working with them, with their clients, so they become part of their operations. They should not just recommend cover crops, but address their management so they do not harbor slugs or snails. Oops. In addition to the rat lung worm, we have seen other invasive species result in serious environmental consequences. After a massive grass dieback, pasture grass dieback, NRCS introduced glycine into the islands. It has been adapted well, and initially there were no problems. Today it is out of control with vines crawling trees and fences. Here, is, here it is smothering a fence post. They smother trees causing dieback. District volunteers work with communities to manage this invasive vine. And I think what, the, what message I'm trying to get across here is what appears okay today may not be okay tomorrow. 
Um, so it's important that you have boots on the ground, aware, being aware of the risks and what can happen. So when the when circumstances change, that you can take immediate action. China gifted access gear to the King of Hawaii. Originally, it was only located on Molokai, but due to hunting demand and evaluation showing that they would not impact native forests, they were introduced to Maui. The original analysis proved to be wrong, and today massive populations can be found on Maui, creating erosion concerns and competing with livestock for scarce forage during drought. Their presence in the watershed, along with feral hogs, threaten the health of the watershed. While their physical impacts to the watershed are well known, they can also carry pathogens through the forest. On the big island, feral animals can carry a fungus that causes a sudden, rapid, sudden death of one of their primary watershed trees, the Ohia. Recently, it has spread to Kauai, so both islands are desperately seeking control measures to rapid ohia death. Pigs and deer are desirable for hunting, but their impact to the watershed and adjacent agricultural operations is severe. A final note when thinking about invasive pests. The federal government has a list of regulated pests. ACES regularly reviews the list and deregulates the pests as they expand into new areas. This is a concern as a pest that is not serious in Montana can be devastating in the South and the tropics. There are unique environments and we need to be aware of these processes in place and voice our concerns as APHIS undergoes these reviews. All of the states have their own examples. I shared you some from Hawaii, invasive species that cause severe impacts. What is obvious is that management of invasive species is not just by agencies, farmers, ranchers, and districts. It must be part of everyone's business. Telling a friend and neighbor about what invasive species can do is important. I believe it was a backyard gar grower that brought citrus greening to Florida. If he had only known the consequences that could occur, Districts can play a valuable role in educating the community about the risks along with management of invasive species. Mahalo. And at this time, I'd like to pass it on to Michelle Delapine and Lindsay Carr from the Pacific Northwest. Thank you, May. It's, it's really exciting to see the Western Governors Association um, Pay attention to the conservation districts and invite us to participate in this webinar today. Uh, so thank you. So um, my name is Michelle Dalpine and I am with the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. I am one, um, I work with uh, one of four soil and water conservation districts that are located in the greater Portland area, and I implement our district's early detection rapid response program. And while we're focused on several high priority invasive plant species, uh, one species that has risen to the top for us for the past several years is invasive garlic mustard. So garlic mustard uh, was introduced from Europe in the 1800s. Uh, it has since uh, taken over large areas of the Northeast, uh, the East Coast, and through the Midwest, uh, where it has um, degraded uh, woodlands and forests. And there are lots of examples of where um, garlic mustard is the predominant ground cover. Uh, it is a um, biennial herbaceous plant. In its first year, it uh, forms this basal rosette with dark green leaves, heart shape, with scalloped edges. And the following spring, it, uh, the stem elongates and bolts up into a flowering stalk about three to four feet tall, although that's uh, 
that um, that height definitely varies. And the flowers are uh, four petaled and always white. And um, after a few weeks, they elongate into seed pods, and the seed pods eventually harden, and um, lots of black, dark seed will be present by early summer, if not managed. Garlic mustard is considered an ecosystem modifier. Uh, where it becomes established, um, it has definitely been documented to cause ecological imbalance. Uh, it's a highly plastic uh, plant that adapts easily to different growing conditions and climates, even um, uh, in the same geographic area in response to climate variations. And there is some evidence that it might even be allopathic or um, causing, uh, uh, causing uh, the soil chemistry to be altered, um, particularly the fungi that native plants rely on. Uh, this has been called into question with recent studies, but in any case, um, the impacts of garlic mustard have been widely documented, uh, not as widely documented in the Pacific Northwest, however. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Northwest, uh, there is uh, the, there's a range um, called the Cascade Range that stretches uh, north into British Columbia through Washington, Oregon, and into Northern California that separate the region into a more moist, um, an area with more moist maritime climate and uh, an area east of the Cascades that, that is more dominated by arid conditions. Uh, west of the Cascades, we've seen garlic mustard inhabit a wide range of areas, uh, everything from uh, open, droughty, disturbed sites to closed canopy, moist riparian areas that are fairly intact. Uh, east of the Cascades, we've seen um, garlic mustard be moisture limited. So uh, mostly a problem in riparian corridors, such as along the Umatilla River and uh, in high elevation woodland areas. So here is a picture of garlic mustard uh, in, um, in, a, in baiting a edge habitat a woodland area, and you can see it's capable of of um, becoming uh, essentially a monoculture in the understory. And anytime we have uh, an invasive species that's capable of, um, of becoming this successful on the landscape is definitely a cause for alarm. Uh, the other thing that really um, concerns us is garlic mustard's ability to invade even relatively undisturbed habitats uh, definitely um, raises the level of concern for the species. Uh, here is an example of garlic mustard um, invading a forested area uh, and even competing with grasses. And this is a site that was um, uh, invaded over the course of just a few years. That was brought in uh, through heavy equipment at a home site. And um, within just a few years, uh, it was all the way deep into the woods. And here is an example of garlic mustard in a riparian corridor. So um, I started working on garlic mustard in 2011. And um, I think a lot of folks that are in the conservation district world sometimes feel a little bit isolated from other conservation districts and um, kind of wondering like, well, how are other people managing the similar um, challenges that I'm facing? And in the fall of 2014, I reached out to uh, folks that were working on garlic mustard in Seattle at the King County Noxious Weed Control Program. And um, within just a matter of weeks, uh, we reached out to folks across Oregon, Washington, and even the, some of those folks further reached out to folks in Alaska and British Columbia. And we um, had a meeting and uh, sat down to address some of these high level questions. Uh, and then um, we've continued these meetings each year 
uh, in the fall. And um, throughout the year, we keep in touch via a listserv. And while many of us do share similar goals, we all come um, from different backgrounds, slightly different experiences, and face different challenges. So the folks that make up the working group really vary. It's mostly um, folks that are working uh, on noxious weed issues uh, across the region, so soil and water conservation districts, noxious weed control boards, city and regional government uh, involved in natural resources, parks utility districts, uh, state noxious weed staff, and then um, uh, in, in our group, the Oregon Invasive Species Council and the Washington Invasive Species Council is also active. And then uh, in Western Oregon, our um, CWMAs, our Cooperative Weed Management Areas, um, are uh, kind of organized under an umbrella organization called the Western Invasives Network. And so we've all um, come together to form this partnership, and this partnership continues to grow. So the um, working group really came together initially to address some of these high-level questions um, that we had. Uh, so fortunately, in the Portland area, um, we have several organizations that already work closely together through our four-county cooperative weed management area. But there were still questions on, well, how do other people manage garlic mustard uh, across the region? And so our first meeting, we, um, we asked ourselves some of these high-level questions and uh, went around in a roundtable format to share um, our management goals and strategies. And with a few notable exceptions, we found that most people were targeting all known populations for control. And, um, and uh, that we shared that common goal, which was um, something that wasn't really known before we got together. Uh, we looked at um, what we were doing to control the plant. We addressed prevention methods, which I think anyone who's worked with noxious weeds or other invasive species um, has grappled with how do we focus on our prevention efforts. It's really challenging um, to address something that's a little more abstract than uh, actually controlling an invasive species physically when that's in front of you and you can um, manually or chemically or otherwise control it. Uh, so we've um, come up with some solutions I'll get to here in a minute. Um, also looked at survey gaps, outreach products, maps, and more. So it kind of organized our goals into three main areas, prevention, outreach, surveying and mapping, and best management practices. And together they underlay the foundation of our regional collaboration. So prevention and outreach, this is one that we definitely um, have struggled with, but I feel like we've come up with some solutions. So garlic mustard is one that um, spreads easily through contaminated soil uh, and easily is spread through boots walking through infested areas, picking up seed in the soil, uh, especially um, in the western parts of our region where we have high clay content. And even within our own agencies and um, noxious weed staff, we've struggled with just remembering to brush our boots to brush the seeds off. And out of one of our meetings, we came up with the idea, oh, we should have these decals. So um, uh, we're fortunate that King County Noxious Weed Control Program um, designed these uh, awesome window decals using some artwork from another member in our, um, in our group, John Wagner from East Multnomah SWCD. And um, these have been a great reminder, not only for Noxious Weed staff, but also for other natural resources staff who might um, be contributing to the problem, but uh, might not be intimately involved in noxious weed work. And um, we've also provided these to contractors and uh, have used these at outreach events to really get our message across. And um, earlier in our formation, we also put together these noxious weed do not put in yard waste bags 
that um, helped get the message across that we were concerned with garlic mustard continuing to set seed even after it had been pulled and um, really uh, conveys the message that these weeds need to be disposed of properly, not uh, into the compost stream. And uh, we've shared other, um, other materials as well, such as presentations that were put together for parks recertification courses. Uh, and um, again, incorporating some cool artwork from uh, our member, John Wagner. And, you know, I think this just goes to show that with collaborations like this, you can really um, share a lot of materials instead of like having to reinvent the wheel, really um, utilize things that have already been put together. And a tool that we've been taking a closer look at in our prevention efforts is uh, the water powered boot brush. Uh, this is a boot brush that's put to, that uh, is designed by Gui Lehman. And um, we've looked at incorporating these uh, in our prevention practices and um, get through some of the logistical challenges of using them in the field, uh, but certainly uh, a viable option wherever you have um, water access. And then finally, our, um, our uh, each, well, twice we put together a poster presentation, uh, kind of summarizing all of our discussions uh, and putting it into a nice, easily digestible format that we can share with uh, other um, with others that may be not working uh, right directly with the working group, but um, could certainly benefit from what we've um, learned. And this is something that uh, various members of the working group have taken to their own local events or regional conferences. And that is available on uh, our webpage, which I'll show here at the end. So uh, surveying and mapping, I think you know a lot of us have probably struggled with um, with sharing our data. I know we have, uh, especially given that um, there are so many mapping platforms out there that are already being used for various grant reporting and so forth. And um, how, to, how to share all of our data into one place is definitely something we've been struggling with. And I know um, the Western Governors Association is um, taking a hard look at this as well. Uh, so we did put together some regional maps that show density and these helped inform our discussions on identifying survey gaps. We have them for Washington, Oregon, as well as Alaska and British Columbia. And then the thing that I'm perhaps the most um, excited about is our work in um, refining our integrated pest management matrix. Uh, this IPM matrix was adapted from the Western Invasive Network uh, IPM guide for garlic mustard and is a product of several years of collaborations and refining our IPM methodologies uh, as we try new things such as fall rosette treatments or look at new chemicals that come out such as Vaslan. And this is also available on our website. So I hope I've inspired some of you at least to consider how you might go about um, starting your own collaboration or partnership uh, locally and regionally, uh, it really is fairly easy to put together. It's just a matter of uh, reaching out to um, some key partners. I would start with your local cooperative weed management area. Uh, we are fortunate uh, in the Western United States to have several active state invasive species councils and of course state invasive species programs. And ultimately, reaching out to other local outfits that are managing invasive species hyper-locally is really important. And um, as someone who is, uh, you know, works at a soil and water conservation district, I definitely appreciate this point because you know, we are the boots on the ground, so we see a lot of things um, day in and day out, year in and year out, that don't necessarily get shared with other people, other soil and water conservation districts that might be faced with the same challenges. 
And again, a lot of those solutions can be scaled up for um, you know, collective regional knowledge. And um, certainly the same age, it's never been easier to get together remotely. Um, although I will say that nothing beats an in-person meeting if we can um, make that happen. And uh, finally, um, this is our, um, a link to our webpage where uh, you can access our, um, all of our materials, our summary posters, our IPM matrix, uh, as well as our fun graphical comic notes that we have um, uh, from each year, <laughs> and uh, as well as our more formal meeting minutes. And then if you're interested in joining the listserv, there's a link there as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Carr, who is one of our members of the um, Garlic Mustard Working Group. And she is going to highlight her work implementing a garlic mustard uh, program for the Clackamas River Basin. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, yeah, like Michelle said, my name is Lindsay Carr, and I'm an invasive plant specialist with the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, and that's in uh, our offices in Oregon City, which is near Portland, Oregon. And Clackamas SWC is part of the Garlic Mustard Working Group, so I'm going to continue on what Michelle talked about by discussing garlic mustard control and the Clackamas River Invasive Species Partnership. So the Clackamas River Invasive Species Partnership, otherwise known as CRISP, is a group of 14 partners. We have public, private, and nonprofit partners, such as the uh, U.S. Forest Service, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon Parks and Recreation, County Parks, Portland General Electric, which is a private electric company, um, as well as the Clackamas Basin Watershed Council, which is a nonprofit, um, and some other partners as well. And we meet twice a year to discuss um, a variety of invasive species concerns. And because of this partnership, we have an incredible amount of collaboration. So partners in CRISP contribute their knowledge, their staff time, and or money so that we can carry out projects within the watershed. So the partnership also provides a platform to ask for more funds, which allows us to do even more work. And this, along with this great partnership, attracts even more money. So it's a really great cycle. The partnership has also really allowed us to expand our treatments of many weeds, including garlic mustard, and it's also allowed us to expand our survey program. The funds that we have have also uh, allowed us to hire a coordinator for that partnership, which is me. And uh, finally, the collaboration in the partnership really helps us to be more effective for a few reasons. One is that we come together in our meetings and we set priorities together. We also share our data on the effectiveness of our treatments and the locations of new weed populations. Uh, we can also address gaps in management. For example, uh, because weeds aren't really paying attention to property lines, often a public land manager will treat a weed only to be reinfested by the neighboring property that's private. So the conservation district, as well as the watershed council, we can then step in and work with the private landowners. So uh, the CRISP watershed has a, or the CRISP partnership has a watershed approach, and we are focused on the Clackamas River watershed in Oregon. So as the partnership began, we gathered and set priorities together, keeping the whole watershed and our resource limits in mind. And so we set some geographic priorities and on areas that had high quality habitat or they had a lot of human activity uh, just because of the human activity increases the potential for spread of the weeds. And also on places where Chris partners we're investing significant amounts of restoration efforts. 
So you can see in the map on the right, it shows our geographic priorities in dark gray. And the largest gray area in the southern portion is the national forest, and that covers about two-thirds of the watershed. And I won't go into details on our outreach, but uh, through mailings, our website, press releases, and a variety of events, we've really been able to access a lot of land uh, to treat weeds. So the map on the left shows just the lowest 20 miles of the Clackamas River. And in pink are all the properties that are either uh, private properties that we're working on or public pro properties that a partner manages. And we have over 650 properties where we are working with the owner or a land manager. And uh, the National Forest only counts as one property. So on to garlic mustard. So we did a bit of a dispersal and distribution analysis. And so we, um, looking at this map um, and some other maps that we made, we saw, noticed that outside the Clackamas that 23% of garlic mustard patches were within a floodplain, whereas within the Clackamas Basin, 82% of the patches were within a floodplain. And part of that reason is that garlic mustard often prefers disturbance and also its wet seeds can stick to dirt and leaves and so they can get spread around um, in a river setting. And the other areas that get infested um, are trails, roadsides, parks, and forests. And this information has really allowed us to focus our attention on the floodplain. Um, and you might also think um, this happened because we're only looking at the floodplain, but uh, take a look at the map again, and the pink areas are places where we have surveyed, and the blue areas are the floodplain, So, and the dark dots show the garlic mustard. So 82% of those garlic mustard dots are within the floodplain. So uh, some of our treatment strategies for garlic mustard, uh, we generally do two spring treatments per site, and we really try to treat the plants before they go to seed. Um, and we treat both flowering plants and rosettes, so that's the first year plants and the second year plants. Um, and we, yeah, we try to treat them both. Um, we utilize both spraying and hand pulling, and the Hand pulling uh, really gives us a lot of contractor flexibility because then they can work on rainy days and they can also continue to treat the plants when they are um, getting kind of too close to uh, going to seed. Um, we also have been util utilizing some fall treatments and these have been really helpful in situations where we have carpets of seedlings um, or when we have a, a lot of seedlings that are intermixed with native plants, um, especially native annuals that would go to seed by the fall. So by um, treating the garlic mustard in the fall, we are allowing those native annuals to go to seed so that they are better able to regenerate. And also by spraying in the fall, uh, it makes our spring treatments a lot lighter as well, which is great. One of the uh, trickiest parts about the Clackamas River is there's a lot of islands, and islands are really tricky to manage. Uh, the ownership has been difficult to determine, and just the management history of the islands has been difficult. And we also don't have a boat, so that makes it also kind of difficult. So it was a really large gap in our management. Um, but through the partnership, we collaborated with multiple partners. We had over five partners collaborating um, just to figure out who owns these islands and who had been treating them or was planning to treat them. And through the help of another partner that had a boat, we were able to find the largest, most upstream garlic mustard patch and then were able to treat it. And so at this point, um, all of the islands, except for one private island, were controlled in 2018. 
and we have plans to repeat the treatment in 2019. So some of our successes with the Clackamas River Invasive Species Partnership, and in particular our garlic mustard control, is, um, well, for one, our, it is really quite difficult to actually measure the treatment effectiveness of garlic mustard. Um, garlic mustard control is really long-term, and sometimes you don't see um, the effects until maybe 10 years sometimes. But some of our successes are that through the program, we've been able to survey over 700 sites since 2016. And um, of those sites, 39 of them had garlic mustard. We've also been able to increase our treatment through the partnership. So in 2015, we surveyed, or sorry, we treated 13 sites and then we're able to increase it. So by 2018, we were able to treat 74 sites. Uh, another success is that we've found new patches of garlic mustard that we've been able to control. And also through these surveys, we've been able to find a lot of new class A species, which are really high priority species, um, and other weeds. And we've also found a lot of properties with no priority weeds, which is also a huge win. Um, another success is we've surveyed a lot of the upper watershed, which is the national forest, and we haven't found any garlic mustard up there, so that's been really encouraging. We also surveyed uh, 10 sites um, recently that have found just a few plants, and then we return the next year to find nothing or almost nothing, which means that it's really likely that we controlled the plants before the seeds had a chance to build up in the seed bank. And so that um, is also a really big success, and it makes our eradication of the plant on that property a lot more likely. So, and that's all I have. So um, I'm going to pass now to Debbie Hughes. Debbie Hughes from Mexico. And uh, I also want to thank the Western Governors Association. I uh, really appreciate it. And I think there's just uh, lots and lots of opportunities to work with the conservation districts. And it's real interesting to learn about other states, even though I've worked for 24 years with these folks, I, uh, I am always amazed. So I'm gonna talk about invasive species management in New Mexico, and I'm gonna do some focus on some of our woody invasive species. Um, we started a, a huge partnership called Restore New Mexico it actually got started getting funding back in 2005, and actually we were um, told uh, that part of our equip money had to actually be spent on federal land. So that was a, a, a you know big thing to try to figure out. Uh, we did start working with the BLM and Forest Service, but BLM came to the table and said they would match dollar for dollar. So um, that's where our association got involved and to help coordinate and working through the conservation districts and actually helping each landowner to do a plan um, with that money. So there, there's been multiple benefits with this big partnership. Um, we've been able to um, really help the rangeland, help the streams, help water quality. There's just multiple benefits. Um, but we've also been able to help um, a few species keep from getting listed as endangered. Um, we, we've seen that really help with the um, soil health, uh, improve wildlife habitat, reduce impacts of, of catastrophic fire, and just um, on and on with, with great benefits just by working on removal of these invasive species. We figured out that being able to work on large landscape projects um, really was more cost effective and we were able to just bring in more partners and more resources and we've um, got over 300 partners but um, as you can see on the slide the picture um, on the on the left showing some of this creosote and mesquite and after treatment without even um, reseeding the seeds were there in the soil but getting rid of those competitive invasive species we were able to really improve the the whole uh, ecosystem. So um, after we got going and the Bureau of Land Management figured out the soil and water conservation districts were an excellent 
way to uh, get money on the ground. We were, we did get a, a grant for $10 million uh, over five years that really helped us leverage a lot more of the funding from NRCS and from private landowners. Um, we got that on the ground in about four years. But uh, here's another example of a before and after treatment, 2005 and 2008. And as you can see, the bare ground uh, and the, just everything going on there is, is improved. And here's a, a good example. We started out with a high percentage of shrubs, like 78 to one. We turned that around completely with all the different grasses. And you can also see that we went from just a couple of kinds of grasses out there barely surviving to just a, a great diversity of the different kinds of grasses and forbs just by getting rid of these invasive species. Um, here is a, an example of what a lot of the, the West looks like and a lot of um, New Mexico um, has looked like. It's, this is mesquite um, and uh, it was really has spread and, and as you can see, not quite a monoculture, but definitely um, real big problem in the Southeast. Um, we've been able to use um, airplanes to treat these large scale projects and um, that's been very effective. Um, there's a new treatment. Um, traditionally, when you, when you treat it, the drops just kind of hit the uh, top of the leaves and now with this electrostatic, this new chemical disbursement technique, the, uh, the herbicide is actually clinging to all sides of the leaf and much more effective and uh, getting a, a great, lot higher rate of, uh, of kill on the plant. Uh, you can see here from a treated and untreated area, just a fence line, what a difference it is in the, the production. So it's not only helping the livestock producer, it's helping the wildlife. It's also, like I said, helping with the soil health and water infiltration, and of course out here in the desert, that is a very, very important thing. Um, here's a, another picture. This one is like two years after the treatment. And as you can see, just an amazing, amazing response. Uh, we joke that uh, one of the main reasons we made it work so well is we put rain in the NEPA document to make sure that uh, we have plenty of rainfall here in the desert Southwest. Um, here's another example, same kind of thing happened. Um, just really turned around the whole area. Uh, one of the treatments was mesquite and the other one was creosote, but in both cases, we just saw a wonderful response just by getting rid of that invasive species. This is just to show you just in one part of New Mexico, this is just Southeast New Mexico. Um, over the years, as you can see, we've done large treatments. Um, and um, just this, this part of the state is a million and a half acres statewide. We have, we're up to about 4 million acres now in our, uh, in our project. And uh, what's been really exciting is just to see that bare ground um, change so dramatically from, from a high percentage to a low percentage and uh, just turn around um, completely what you know, what kind of uh, growth and cover and percentage of production that we had going on by uh, treating, treating these areas. Here's another, just uh, showing you kind of the pounds per acre. And of course, when you have all that litter on the ground, as opposed to that bare ground, you're protecting that soil, really, really helping to protect it from not having so much soil erosion. And once again, like I said, helping that water to infiltrate back into your aquifer. Um, this was so successful that we've actually gotten two additional grants from the Bureau of Land Management in 2011 and 2015. Both of those uh, were up to $20 million. I think the 2011, it was um, about 13, over $13 million that we put on the ground. Then we received this new grant, which we're still working on. Um, we've already got about $11 million of that on the ground. But the partnerships between uh, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, the NRCS, the local conservation districts, uh, Department of Agriculture, private landowners, what we found out is the more that you can leverage these funds, the more that you can work together and partner, the, the greater uh, success you can have. Um, another species that 
is all over the West. And um, I think, you know, it was planted to help with erosion. And just like May said in the first, first presentation, sometimes what we think was a good deal ends up not being such a good deal. And um, this stuff will take over, especially along your streams and rivers and become a monoculture and uh, uses a lot of water. And uh, we've been able to use helicopters um, along the um, along the rivers and, and canyons and get in there and uh, and treat this initially. Then our in some places though we have to do it mechanically because we have other native species like cottonwood trees that would be affected and uh, this is much more expensive per acre. And then we also have been able to um, you know pile them up in some cases. The Bureau of Land Management has brought in their fire crews and burned these piles after we, um, we've uh, piled them up and this was on private state and federal land. It's just been a huge partnership. And um, the other thing that we've really utilized uh, the last four years is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. I know Travis mentioned this earlier. You have to apply for this money. You have to show that you have leverage and that you have a lot of partners, um, but bringing, um, actually $11 million um, to New Mexico statewide for lands that are ranches, checkerboard ranches, they're, they're private, state, and federal, but being able to use some of this Farm Bill money on forest land and Bureau of Land Management land has made a huge difference in being able to, like I said, continue to leverage and partner. And then um, there also was a, another 1.2 million that came just to one watershed. And I'll tell you a little bit about that here in a second. So um, this, um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but we had six oil and gas companies come together and contribute three and a half million dollars. Um, and this is for a specific watershed um, in southeastern New Mexico, where there's a lot of oil and gas drilling going on right now, uh, the Permian Basin, uh, NRCS and BLM in Texas and New Mexico also contributed another three and a half million. This money is only available in the form of grants that you have to apply for through the, um, that, uh, the, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And so um, we have applied, we, have, we got the first grant last year for $247,000. And like I said, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, they're excellent at partnering and leveraging. Uh, that $247,000 became over $2 million. Um, they were able to get three to one match for the for the non federal part, uh, actually the oil and gas money, for another four hundred sixty five thousand. Another company put in fifty thousand, and there was um, additional money from BLM, the local soil and water conservation district, and others. And and within just a few months, we treated another fifty seven thousand acres um, at thirty five dollars and ninety cents per acre. And like I said, just doing the larger scale actually helps us get the price down and we're able to do more acres. So some of this actually was, was equip um, um, dollars that was put into this with one big project to get it done quicker and on the ground. And um, so we've applied for more. We haven't got, you know, don't know what we're awarded yet, but we do expect to uh, get some more of that. And one of the things I wanna make sure and highlight is by doing these giant partnerships together, by by working towards improving the habitat, the lesser prairie chicken pictured here, as well as the little lizard down here, the dune sand lizard, have not become listed as endangered yet. Uh, unfortunately, the mussel that you see did get listed, the Texas hornshell mussel, but that's also what brought, I think, together the, the oil companies because the mussel is listed on a couple of small tributaries in the middle of the oil field um, that we're working in. And so we're focusing a lot of work on the upland work um, areas there where that Texas hornshell mussel is to try to improve those areas. But anything we can do to get out front and improve the habitat and keep things from getting listed is gonna be more beneficial for everybody. So just, just a little, um, give you a, an idea, um, I think I said over 4 million, so this slide is a little outdated, but it is public, private, and state land that we're treating all together. Just the Restore New Mexico program in 13 years was about $70 million that was, um, was all put together, private, state, federal, and um, we're continuing to do that today. 
this shows you a little breakdown. And as you can see from the bottom, lots and lots of different kinds of tools, um, chemical, mechanical, prescribed fire, and shows you the breakdown of the, the lands that have been treated. And um, we just uh, really uh, appreciate and recognize that the Soil and Water Conservation Districts are local government on the land and are the local delivery system. We really appreciate this opportunity to work with the uh, Western Governors Association and the opportunity to, to talk about what we're doing and learn more about what others are doing. And uh, we hope that um, this, this information helps others and uh, thank you very much. And I, I think I'm supposed to pass it back to Travis. Yes, thank you, Debbie. Panelists, great job. Uh, I'm amazed at the great work uh, that you've been doing uh, in your own respective areas. Uh, you've spoken both technically um, and uh, also to the resources available to you. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for this time that we're gonna spend over the next little bit uh, to have a moderated discussion and to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the things that uh, you've spoken about today. And again, uh, if I can remind uh, the participants out there, if you will send uh, any questions you have to uh, Kevin uh, Moss uh, through the individual chat, we'll try and capture those questions and, and do the best that we can uh, to get them answered. So uh, panelists, and, and this is for uh, all of you, and, and feel free to answer this question. As I, I've been sitting here listening to the great things that you've you've spoken about, a common theme that I've heard has been the importance of collaboration through partnerships. And uh, each of you, whether it be on uh, an individual uh, field or, or property or landscape scale restoration, uh, each of you really highlighted the importance of partners. And I'm curious, as those that are on the phone and, and uh, other conservation districts are at different levels maybe in their partnerships. Can you speak to some of the challenges um, that you've experienced and uh, how you've overcome those challenges as it relates to collaboration with partnerships and becoming successful uh, as you address those invasive species uh, management challenges? If we can maybe, um, Michelle, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, the partnerships and some of the challenges that you've experienced? Yeah, so um, on one hand, we've been fortunate in that uh, for the most part, a lot of the partners have been consistent. We've had um, consistent staff, uh, although there have been some challenges, um, especially in British Columbia and Alaska uh, with turnover and just um, staying engaged with uh, with the partners as new, new staff come on board. Uh, so I'd say that's definitely been one of our, our hardest challenges is just, um, you know, uh, as there's a little bit of turnover engaging new, new people uh, into the discussion, uh, but also just identifying and, and getting the word out to folks that could benefit that may not have um, have found the group through the means that we've um, done our outreach. Uh, so that's been a big one um, for us anyways. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, any other panelists? Uh, Mayor Debbie, can you speak to some of the challenges uh, and, and opportunities in those partnerships? Well, this, this is Debbie, I just, um, I think I just can't stress how much um, relationships, how important the relationships are. And uh, you've really got to have those relationships with, with the upper level management that, that make the decisions on, on the funding. And, you know, in some cases that means even all the way to Washington, D.C. because um, like she said about people changing as administrations change, um, things happen too. And so trying to, trying to educate people about, about what you're doing and how well it works so that you can keep that funding, you know, coming is critically important. Um, I think since I've been involved, we've had, um, I'm on my fourth 
state conservationist with um, NRCS and the fourth director of BLM. So that's just an example. Mm. The good thing is the conservation districts themselves have been around uh, over 75 years and they're a very stable force there. So that's, that's the good thing about it. But definitely uh, there, is, there is challenges. Great, great, thank you. Uh, any anyone else uh, panelists wise want to speak to uh, maybe some of those challenges and opportunities with the partnerships? Yeah, this is me from Hawaii. Um, I agree with um, Debbie that the, the most serious challenge is change. And when you have change in um, people and Travis, you know this in Hawaii, um, having the continuity becomes very difficult. So having a good communication system is very important. And, you know, very often those of us immersed in the issue can get very technical. And really the boots on the ground are what's important and they can carry the message too. So having the message simple enough that the average John Q public can um, talk about it with passion and how it relates to him um, becomes very important. Great, thank you, May. Debbie, as you spoke about um, developing relationships and uh, perhaps sometimes even meeting with those in Washington, D.C., uh, the the, uh, the upper level, um, I guess, decision makers in some of the federal agencies. Um, this question has a little bit to do with more of the statutory or regulatory fixes as it relates to invasive species management. So what sort of uh, statutory regulatory mechanisms or fixes are needed to better enable conservation districts to prevent and control invasive species? Okay, thanks for that question. Um, I, I think that, um, in fact, I was in D.C. last week, and I did meet with some folks at, at BLM and Interior, and, um, you know, they're looking at um, trying to use the, the good neighbor authority more, which I'm not sure has necessarily been used a lot by conservation districts. Um, I think the conservation districts will be able to use that because they are government entities. Um, probably helping some of these, um, some of the federal and state agencies understand that conservation districts are also government agencies or political subdivisions, um, you know, is, is something we've got to do. Um, but then there may, there may need to be a few changes too. If, uh, for example, I don't think the good neighbor authority allows for you to work um, with a nonprofit, which our state association is, and, you know, we've just been coordinating it with um, all the, you know, working through the conservation districts. So there was one big agreement instead of um, a lot of other ones. So there may need to be some tweaks there. I know right now, um, you know, anything over $50,000 has to go back up to the DC level for approval. And so, you know, it kind of slows things down as, as things change. So um, it, what we found critically valuable is if you can get folks out on the ground with, you know, and we've had some secretaries of interior, we've had some of the BLM directors from, from DC and actually take them out and, and show them those on the ground tours or, and then on those tours have all your different partners there, you know, the ranchers and the oil and gas folks, environmentalists and everybody. Um, that, that has been you know, probably one of the most valuable things we've done, but it does, uh, sometimes we have to, to be able to tweak some of these regulations to make them make them fit but the conservation district the value we have is they already are set in place to work on the ground and they can work on all different kinds of property where most other entities don't have that um, you know ability great thank you Debbie I really appreciate uh, the focus on the importance of conservation districts as I, I think that's the overarching message that uh, um, you know I'm, I'm relearning always is the importance of conservation districts. Um, so just a reminder, we've got about um, uh, 15 minutes left on the webinar and we've received uh, quite a few uh, questions um, from the uh, participants. And uh, if we don't get to all of them today, 
I know uh, the webinar is, is being recorded. You'll have access to the slides, and I know each of the, the panelist members here would uh, be happy to entertain uh, questions uh, individually if we, if we don't get to them today. Um, if I can reach out to uh, Michelle and Lindsay, there's a question that's come in um, about um, pertaining to garlic mustard, and this is applicable to many other species out there. But um, is there any action being taken to prevent noxious weed availability within certain markets? Meaning, um, garlic mustard can be purchased in some stores. And I know in Hawaii there are invasive species uh, that can be purchased and planted. Can, can you speak to any actions that um, perhaps the work group is working on uh, to provide that greater awareness and, and uh, um, any availability for invasive species, whether it be at your local garden store or any other store out there? And certainly. So uh, this is Michelle Delphine. Um, you know, one, one, uh, one thing about the conservation districts that's important to know is um, we are non-regulatory, so we really uh, strive hard to keep, uh, keep good relationships with private landowners. And, um, and not do anything to kind of harm that trust. Uh, but we do rely heavily on, uh, on our state regulatory authorities um, to follow up uh, with um, noxious weeds concerns such as that. Um, we, we generally don't make those uh, reports, but uh, you know, that's certainly something that the state uh, agencies are tasked with. Uh, I know in Oregon we have a nursery inspection program. Uh, you know, certainly if uh, a species is a regulated noxious weed, it's not allowed to be uh, sold uh, or in the, in the nursery trade. Uh, although um, I will say that if there are new invasive species that are um, a concern, uh, conservation districts, CWMAs, uh, and so forth can certainly nominate an invasive species for a listing. Great, thank you, Michelle. Any, any other panelists want to speak to the availability of uh, invasive species uh, on the market? Uh, I can add something. Oh, <laughs> this is Lindsay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just have a specific example. Um, we have um, a lot of listservs that um, a lot of weed managers are um, part of. And recently, I think it was sometime in the last year, um, we had on the listserv somebody mentioned that they were seeing an invasive plant available in a store. I think it was uh, Phragmites, which is um, an invasive grass. Um, and immediately, like that day, um, somebody on my staff was able to reach out to the store. I actually went to the store and talked to people, and like within a day or two, they were able to pull that item that was for sale that had the grass from their store. So I just think the the communication is um, really important because sometimes people that are selling invasive plants don't realize what they're doing or what the impacts can be from the plant. So. Great, great comment. If I can, maybe on that uh, awareness slash education uh, point, can can any of you speak to the role of social media or other communication forms of, of media um, that help in awareness campaigns for invasive species management? Have any of you uh, been successful using social media to um, improve awareness. This is me from uh, Hawaii speaking. Um, yes, yeah, social media is a very powerful tool. Um, in our experience, and um, it, it's kind of an exception from what the kinds of situations the rest of you are speaking about. And I'm going to go back to the rat lung worm. I think with social media, we have to re remember that fear is a very powerful motivator. And for those of us on the on the ground that handle these invasive issues, and along with agencies and private entities, you have to be ahead of the game. If you let fear gain control, 
then reason goes out of the door. For example, in our case with the red lung worm, um, the initial response from us would be to manage the rats and the slugs. However, once social media got, um, became involved, it became stop eating leafy greens. So people would not want to, were afraid of eating lettuce, even if there were no commercial um, growers involved in the incident. And there were actually people saying, you have to boil lettuce before you eat it. So miscommunication, social media can also become a tool for miscommunication. So where you have um, invasive species that's mainly from the standpoint of environmental issues, um, there, the communication, I think, is a little different from when health enters into the picture. But it is something very useful um, because we know from our statistics that very few people now read print media. And so getting the print media, the old types of communications don't work. Social media does work, but we also have to be aware that people can select what they um, view and so forth, because you can choose what sites you view. So how to make sure that the correct information gets out fast, accurately, and simply. It cannot be technical. It has to be like at a glance. I really like the food um, uh, icon that you folks created. I think that that type of thing, at a glance, you get the message. You, you need something like that. Great. Thank you, May. Appreciate that feedback on social media and the role it plays in awareness. And uh, I, I know across the country, um, social media is uh, um, successful in, in relaying both positive and negative messages. And I think there is a role um, in uh, invasive uh, management out there for conservation districts and other groups uh, in, in their efforts there. I've got a question for Debbie as it relates to uh, the creosote and mesquite slide that you shared. Um, there's a, a question asking um, about the consideration of native versus non-native plants. Can, can you speak to um, whether they're native, non-native, and where they're considered uh, native and non-native in those areas? And uh, can you speak a little bit about the control and the behavior uh, for those native and non-native species? Sure, thank you. Um, and so um, basically the, um, the mesquite, for example, um, you know, is, is not necessarily a, a, a non-native, but um, what happened in a lot of the, the West was, um, you know, when they had the Homestead Act and they, people came out here and were given a little bit of property and um, tried to make a living, there was just, there was a, a lot of overgrazing that happened in the very early 1900s. And, and because of that, um, you know, people didn't know they were doing what they thought was right at the time. Um, it just really caused a lot of these uh, species to, to become very invasive and take over. And so even some of them that, that may be um, native in some parts of the state, whether it be mesquite or even the creosote, um, have become just, you know, almost nothing else growing there. The, the salt cedar is, is a totally, um, um, it's not from, it's not from uh, New Mexico. In fact, it uh, was brought in out from outside the United States. But whether or not they're native or non-native, when they become almost a monoculture or whatever, that's, that's a problem. And so what we've had to do um, with, with all three of those woody species is in some instances is to use some kind of the appropriate herbicide. But um, what we're, what we're doing and what's in the plans is to, to use that the one time because it is such a large problem. And then we're trying to go back and use um, the natural tools that were really here before our hand, which is a lot of prescribed fire and managed grazing and things like that. And so uh, what has been very rewarding is finding out that within this area, the native seeds of, of the different forbs and grasses are still here in the soil. 
we just had to get the competition out of the way that had uh, become, you know, so invasive. So, uh, so you know, it, it doesn't really matter if they were here or not, if they become the only thing that's here and they take over and, and uh, hurt the rest of the ecosystem, then they're, then they're a bad plant too. So I hope that kind Great. of answers it. Yeah, yeah, Debbie, and I, I think as you spoke about, you know, native versus non-native and uh, the role that that plant plays in the, the ecosystem, um, I know that the, the decision to treat um, those, you know, m mesquite um, was not Debbie Hughes' decision alone. It was the partnership and that collaborative effort to say, hey, this is, these are some challenges in the area. And so I think going back to the partnership, um, that's really important as the partnership brings data to the table. Um, the partnership then makes those decisions of, of uh, what species, how do we manage uh, those, those invasive species, whether they be native or non-native. So thank you. Correct. Yeah. Thank you so much, Travis. And, th and that is so true. And, and there's been, you know, a lot of, lot of research done by a lot of partners and, and folks with, uh, you know, cooperative extension and the universities and everything else as to, uh, you know, what, what tool works best in that toolbox. And I definitely want to make sure we give credit to, to all those in the partnership. Great, thank you, Debbie. All right, I'm, we've, we've received a lot of questions. Um, in fact, a, a few questions on nurseries and uh, in, invasive species and nurseries and whatnot. And I believe that um, Western Governors Association will hold a future webinar that will address um, some of those challenges there. Um, as we wrap up today, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for all the panelists, uh, the great work that they're doing out on the ground. Um, they've talked about boots on the ground, relationships, uh, the importance of, of really leveraging um, that local knowledge to do what is right. Um, and again, uh, no better partner out there than the Conservation District to really lead those efforts. I appreciate all the, the, the questions today from the participants. And as we wrap up, um, I'd like to offer the panelists, uh, if we can start with May, um, just a, a quick closing thoughts uh, on invasive species management and conservation districts, and then we'll turn the time back over to Bill. So May, if you want to wrap up with some closing thoughts, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd like to um, thank the Western Governors for taking this on, but and I think it highlights, by them taking it on, it highlights the importance of working together. So I know the session such as today was very good because we had people from different areas and solutions that, you know, are for their area may work for me, but I come from a very different um, area, but the ideas get spurred, and that's very important. So thank you very much. Thank you, May. Michelle, any th closing thoughts? Thank you, yeah. Um, I did just want to address quickly a question that came up on the feed about pretty plants, and that's something that I definitely have encountered uh, in my outreach to landowners. And um, I'll just say that a lot of times it's just a matter of education. Uh, here in my district, uh, we have quite a um, bit of suburban area that's included in our treatment area. And so we're definitely working with folks that, you know, are, um, they have yards that we might be um, including in our treatment area. And, um, and it's really about educating uh, them about uh, the concerns with even uh, plants that they may have in their yards escaping into uh, adjacent natural areas, and for the most part, I've um, I've had pretty good reception with with that. Uh, and um, as far as the closing thought, I just really want to emphasize that um, you know, with invasive species in general, the most difficult uh, the most difficult thing about managing invasive species is kind of grappling with where to begin, and um, a big part of that is identifying partners who have um, already kind of worked through some of the challenges that you're facing. So uh, again, just really underscoring the need for collaboration and, and thank you um, to the Western Governors Association for 
um, providing uh, such a nice um, targeted discussion on collaboration with conservation districts. Thank you, Michelle. Lindsay? Yeah, I could just speak really quickly. Um, just the importance of collaboration and communication. Uh, I think that really came across uh, in this webinar. Um, just because there are always other people around that have ideas and experience for how to manage invasive species that you may not know about um, and ideas about how to reach out and how to be more effective. So I just think that piece is, just can't be emphasized enough. So yeah, that's all. I agree. Thank you, Lindsay. And then last but definitely not least, Debbie, closing thoughts from you. I also want to thank the Western Governors Association, and I want to thank you, Travis, and um, I, have, I enjoyed and appreciate your passion that I can even hear over the phone. Um, I think that, that we, we are all proving how much that uh, voluntary incentive-based programs actually work. That's, that's how you get things done. Um, I think we all realize we can't do it alone. We have to have partnerships. We also realize that the soil and water conservation districts are the local, uh, you know, best local delivery system because they have that relationship with the landowners. And, um, but I also want to say that uh, we also realize how important NRCS is with their technical support, but also their financial and, and the farm bill dollars, you know, that we all work so hard to get. And, and then when you're working with other federal agencies like BLM and Forest Service that have large, you know, land management areas and different, some different rules and more regulatory agencies, the fact that they can come to the table with us and bring their dollars and, and leverage and, and be great partners is, is just wonderful too. It's, it's been fun and exciting and as long as we're all, you know, continuing to do great things, it's, it's good for the whole partnership. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Debbie. Panelists, again, uh, great job today. Uh, great information. Uh, participants, thank you for all the questions. Uh, we didn't get to all of them, but I know there will be future opportunities uh, to discuss uh, more on collaboration, funding opportunities. Uh, and with that, thank you again uh, to Western Governors Association, and I'll turn the time back over to Bill. Thank you, Travis, and uh, thank you for your moderation. Really appreciated it. I thought it was a great conversation. And thank you to the panelists. Uh, May, Michelle, Lindsay, and Debbie, I thought it was a really good conversation. And thank you to the participants. Those are some great questions, uh, really insightful and targeted. So we appreciate the conversation as well. And just uh, wrapping up here, I would like to let you all know that a recording of this webinar will be available on WGA's website shortly. That's westgov.org under the initiatives page. Recording for that, recording of all our previous workshops, and of all our future webinars in the series. So there, there will be some more uh, webinars in the coming months. I encourage you to look to the WGA website for that or to subscribe to the WGA website. So you can do that at westgov.org. And I encourage you to share this with, share that uh, recording of this and um, the webinar series with your contacts and join us for future webinars. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for a great conversation and we'll see you at the next webinar.